Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Ted Davies Artistry. My name is Ted Davies. I'm an artist and author. If it's your first time here, if you're a creative, this is the place to be. We teach you guys at least how I do it, how I build my creative business as an artist, as an author. And um, every once in a while, I get inspired by a few people, and I try to bring them on in an interview format. Um, if you like that kind of content, then subscribe. Check out what I'm doing on Substack. That's a QR code up there. It will get you right to my Substack and you can hear the podcast uh, that I have. It's kind of a private podcast for five dollars a month. You can subscribe, be part of Ted's tribe, and um, see the behind the scenes of how all this works in the studio and how I do my uh, artwork and tutorials and all that fun stuff. So check that out. I would love for you to be part of uh, Ted's tribe. Today's guest um, is a, a woman that I think uh, I, I just mentioned this to her uh, a minute ago, but. She didn't let corporate America ruin her. And what I mean by that is I, I, I know a lot of us deal with um, uh, toxic corporate structures and not all of us. You know, there's, there's some days that are toxic, some that aren't. Um, but in the industry that she was in um, as an executive with CVS, I'm sure it was uh, it could be very uh, uh, educational, to say the least. Uh, Laverne McKinnon is a now uh, she has moved on to, uh, I think, really uh her life's work and i I'm, I'm so excited to see her uh be creative still doing uh the things uh, with shows and writing and scripts and uh executive producing but also being a mentor being a person that um gives a damn okay so welcome laverne how are you i'm pretty good pretty good well actually i'm really excited to be chatting with you thank you i appreciate it you're Listen, you guys, the, how we, how we met, she didn't know this, but how we met was on with film courage. You guys need to check that, um, YouTube channel out. Cause I was really, uh, if people that don't know, um, it deals with everything about film, uh, every, the nitty gritty. Uh, and it's, it's important that you check out other things other than comics and other than books and other check it all out because you get to meet people, um, that have, uh, that are substantial. Uh, and, and I mean that, um, in, in the, in the utmost respect with you. Um, but let's go, let, let me go back. When did you land on this planet? <laughs> um, I landed on this planet, uh, 59 years ago, 60 in 1965. Awesome. And where was that? Um, it was in Illinois. I was born in Oak Park and I grew up primarily in Darien, which is a mm -hmm. city that's Southwest of Chicago. It was really idyllic, like where every third house is the same, sure. that type of community. Sure. Oak, Oak Park is a very close to my heart. I was a student of Frank Lloyd Wright for many, many, I mean, all through school. And wow. I, and my father was a big, anybody that knows me in architecture is all about, I'm all about Frank Lloyd Wright, everything. Um, so yeah, the, that whole area is just, uh, it's breathtaking. I love it there. I could, I would go and eat lunches, uh, when I had my office in Chicago, I would go there and eat lunch, just, just sitting there. It sounds like complete creeper, but I would just look at the architecture all the time and people get very used to that in that area. They're, you know, very much used to it. That's awesome. I didn't, I mean, another mid Midwest. When did you got, to, when, when did you get out to LA? When, when uh, I moved to LA in 1991. Mm -hmm. Um, after I graduated from college, I actually stayed in Chicago for mm -hmm. several years to write and produce educational films, but I always knew I was going to move to LA. It was just a matter of, I, I was scared. I wasn't ready. I needed to build up my courage. Understood. Um, why don't you tell everybody a little bit, I, I didn't do a very good job as, as far as your background, but tell everybody a little bit about it, just to touch base, just so that they know you know, where you started. I know you started watching TV as a, as we all did, but tell them a little bit about that so they can get a feel for it and then see where you transitioned or where you are now. So, yeah, I, um, so yeah, I was the, that generation where there were no restrictions in terms mm -hmm. of how much television we could watch. So I just, I grew up like loving TV. My sister taught me how to read when I was really little. I just, I love story and mm -hmm. I always wanted to be a part of that. And I thought, uh, maybe I should be an actor. So I studied at Goodman Theater when I was in high school. And then when it came time to go to college, my my dad was like, 
absolutely not. No way. So I majored in radio, television, and film because I thought it, this is like, I was so naive. I thought it was the same thing. I just thought it was in front of the camera instead of on the stage. And then I was like, oh my gosh, there's this whole other world of how content gets made. Mm -hmm. I, it was so painful, like the things that I didn't know. Uh, and then yeah, and so I uh, I did some informational interviews. I recognized that it was like New York or Los Angeles. I don't like the cold, so I was like, I'll go to L.A. And then I started my career in Hollywood as an assistant at an, at a at a talent agency. Awesome. What was that like? Was that a, a baptism by fire, or what was a? Uh, all of the stories that people say are, are mm -hmm. pretty true. I mean, like I worked for a pretty decent guy in the TV packaging department. He had packaged, um, he put together Roseanne yeah. and, uh, it was sort of like getting a, a master's in the entertainment industry. I mean, the, the hours were really long and, uh, but it was a, a really great bird's eye perspective of how entertainment got made. Yeah. I was it, um, was it tough being away from the family or did they visit quite often or what was the dynamic like? Yeah, it was, um, it was hard because my mom died right after I moved mm. to LA and oh, I, sorry. yeah, we didn't even like, we knew that she wasn't feeling well, but we had no idea that, um, she was as sick as she was. So after I, uh, moved to Los Angeles, she was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer oh. and then she died, um, pretty quickly after that, like within weeks. Wow. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, my family didn't really come out to visit. My dad came out a couple of times, but I, I usually, I like to go back to Illinois sure. and visit during a uh, spring, summer and the fall. Yeah. Fall. Yeah. That's <laughs> yeah. one thing that, um, I, I do love fall. I mean, spring and fall in Michigan is just, and that's very similar to Chicago. Yeah, it's very, funny. you know, and I, I, I agree with you hundred percent. I, I lost my mother at that same time too. So oh, I totally, really? I get, I'm, we were right around the same age and, uh, you were a little bit, I'm not saying that older, but you're a little bit older <laughs> than me, yeah. but, um, never, never easy. And yeah. it's, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about grief too, not just grief by losing our, our loved ones, um, when they move on, but, uh, grief, uh, in a different, you, you, you kind of really taught me so much in, in the way that you speak about grief, disenfranchised grief. Mm -hmm. And for those who don't know what that is, you're going to learn a little bit about it today because I think it's fascinating and I completely get it um, from a um, from a corporate level, from from an artist level, from, you know, a PTSD level and not realizing that it's OK, that you're not, you know, suck it up, buttercup. You know, that, that's not right. the way it doesn't have to be like that. And, you know, that you I really that's the message I want you to bring to a lot of these people that are listening that are in situations like that. You know, maybe they are away from home and they're working mm -hmm. and they're not making it and they're trying to make it work financially. And uh, things happen, you know, families get sick and, you know, family members get sick and everything. What's um, what was probably the best move from what you were doing to where you went uh, in, 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 from the early nineties to the mid nineties when all the excitement happened, hmm. what was like yeah. a pivoting point? Yeah, I think the biggest pivot point was, so I worked as an assistant at an agency and then I worked at Klasky Chupo, the animation company sure. for sure. four years. And that was an, an amazing experience and got to get the Rugrats feature off the ground, um, mm -hmm. sold a couple of series. So that was really great. But then I think the the real pivot point in my career was when I went moved from animation into live action, and I went to CBS in 1996, and I joined uh, that that network uh, in children's programming. Mm -hmm. Right at the time when children's programming was in a downturn uh, because Nickelodeon had launched, and all of yeah. a sudden there was children's content every day of the week and kids didn't have to wait until Saturday morning. So I, I joined a dying day part, but it was, yeah. I learned a lot from that, that I think really helped me with my, my next career trajectory. I know that you got promoted pretty quick in the time that you were with CPS, uh, C, CPS, C, CBS, excuse me. Yeah. Um, yeah. What was, uh, what was that? I mean, it, it's like going from, I mean, I'm, I'm car guy. So everything first gear into fifth, I would think. You were saying every two year, what, what was it like? Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was promoted about like every 18 to 24 months. And so wow. I went from children's programming into prime time. And then I was a current executive where I oversaw the shows that were 
on the air. I mean, not all of them, but just a couple. So like I worked on the nanny early edition. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad that I said when I was born, because this is clearly dating me. <laughs> that's great though. What a better problem to have. I mean, yes, that's great. So yeah. Good. And, and it was, uh, and when I moved into prime time, the network, uh, was not doing well, but mm -hmm. then I became a part of the team that helped take the network from last place to first. Right. And that was incredibly heady to sure. like I mean, witness it, be a part of it. And then this was also like a, t a time when, you know, I, I was able to like be one of a small group of people that would take like the corporate jet to New York during upfronts to, awesome. uh, yeah, it, it was, uh, it was exciting. <laughs> did, um, did you ever feel like, uh, you were kind of out of place? Like you weren't not, not that you weren't, but, or that you were, but it was just, you ever feel like you're imposter syndrome? Uh, a hundred percent of the time. Yeah. <laughs> really? Is that around celebrity or around just power players in the industry? Uh, I think it was around, um, I'm an, I'm an introvert. I'm someone who processes information quickly. I mean, excuse me, uh, not quickly. It, okay. it takes me a while to formulate like, what do I think? How do I feel? And, and things move very, very quickly in prime time. It's like, you just like, you have to mm -hmm. move fast. And I'm, I'm, I'm more um, measured in terms of my responses. And so I, it was hard. And then I'm not going to lie. It's like, like the first show that I worked on in prime mm -hmm. time, I would walk onto set. And even though I was an, an executive at the network, like some of my colleagues who were in conversation with the studio folks, like I would walk up and they would like literally like create a circle mm -hmm. and like, and, and I'm just like on the outside. It's like high school. Yeah. Just it like it high was. School. Yeah. Yeah. And the politics are, I mean, like, I really respect the people that I worked with, but you know, it's, it's, there are politics, there's bureaucracy, it's inevitable. So yeah. yeah. And I, I, I've not, I've not been a good political animal. And so that was really hard for me to navigate and that lended to me feeling like an outsider as well. Mm -hmm. Well, you're authentic. And I think that, you know, us as, I mean, you are, I'm going to, I consider you creative totally. And I, I always have had a problem with that political side of things, um, playing mm -hmm. the, you know, shaking the babies and kissing hands, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and you, it's hard because you, you feel like you're, um, I've always felt, I mean, it's good to be, uh, an outsider. You, you said that on one of your podcasts and we're going to make sure all your links are there too. Um, and we'll go, we'll get to into that in a minute, but I think that, um, I, I don't consider it an outsider. I consider it an observer. And that's mm. taken me years to think that way. Um, I didn't really think that way until after I really learned how pathetic some of the circles are and how, mm. you know what, it's a blessing that I'm not in that. Um, did you ever feel like that in the, in the swamp a little bit, or was it always just go, 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 just, you know, uh, make it work, make it work. Yeah, I, I was, uh, I was incredibly ambitious. And so I would find workarounds to yeah. the sense of not belonging. And I really appreciate like how you found that distinction between being an outsider and being an observer, mm -hmm. because yes, indeed, it's like having distance and perspective that allows one to see things Huge. that other people don't, which can be a, a gigantic competitive advantage. I, I, I just leaned into working harder than everybody else, or at sure. least I tried to work harder than everybody else. I don't necessarily know that that was true because everyone was like working their asses off, but I thought, yeah. okay, if I can just show up and be more specific and thoughtful with notes, can I read more material than everybody else? Uh, but it was, yeah, it was, it was I, like I bought into the whole grind mentality, yeah, yeah, not realizing yeah. that there were other options. Yes. And that's, and it goes, it, it can be in LA, it can be in Detroit. I mean, I, I saw people that were in the auto industry that it was unbelievable how much they worked. My dad was a designer mm -hmm. and I saw guys around him that were just blistering to get their name on a car. You know what I mean? Just trying to, it was, and it was ruthless. I mean, some of the stuff they did, I can't even imagine what LA is like. Um, but I can imagine that uh, it, it was probably, like I said, a very interesting dynamic. Um, now, as far as that, how many um, how many executives were women? I don't mean that in a derogatory term, but just just I mean, what was it? What was it like? 
Yeah, I don't have a percentage, but like my boss was a woman, her boss was a woman, okay. the head of business affairs was a woman. Um, uh, there was only one male in our department and our drama development department. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think CBS did a pretty good job of uh, supporting and promoting women for the most part, Excellent. although... Okay. Ironically, I do have to say that when I was head of a department at CBS, mm -hmm. uh, a, a, a man was brought into the department who I was delighted with and respected tremendously. And then HR sent me his paperwork to sign and he was making more money than me. And, Ouch. and I'd Ouch. been at the network longer. I'd had more wins at the network than he did. And, yeah. and, um, if HR hadn't sent me that start paperwork to sign, I would have never known. I, yeah. I actually think that they, it was a mistake that they sent it to me. I think that they were supposed to send it to my boss, but uh, they rectified the situation. However, it's there so, was still a bias that existed. Wow. And yeah, how do you now see the old Ted? I would be like livid. I would be like, I can't believe this is going. I would have taken it right to the top and in a corporate structure. Yeah. That's just how I was. Yeah. Um, and I probably would have gotten fired for it, you know, um, just because of the, the, the immaturity, I guess. How did you, how did you, uh, <laughs> how'd you do it? How did you get uh, through that? Did you, you didn't treat, I know you didn't treat them any differently. You're not like that, but is it, how did you manage it? Uh, I, you know, I, I don't remember the specifics, but I, I do remember being upset and surprised yeah. and, and shocked. And, and so so again, while they rectified it immediately, um, it just, it made me aware that there are things that are happening behind yeah. the scenes that I just wouldn't typically have access to. Mm -hmm. And, and it put a spotlight on for me that I was missing advocates and mentors in my life who could have guided or side coached me. Like when I was in negotiations of things, like sure. I just didn't know that there were things to ask for. Sure. I, I was absolutely clueless. And then years later, I would find out like, oh, I didn't know that you could be reimbursed for mileage. I didn't yeah. know that the company might, you know, pay something for your, your car rental or lease because you're driving all over the place on behalf of the company. Like I just didn't know that that was like standard yeah. stuff to ask for. Uh, so I, I recognize a huge gap and uh, the hard truth is I never really close that gap. I don't, like I had, I've had amazing advocates, but I've never had a mentor, you know, like that person who would be like, Hey, Laverne, you know, like the way that you're saying something yeah. is actually not landing. You're not reading the room or, Hey, there's a, you know, an opportunity here that you could, you know, come up with a, a proposal or something and, you know, shine a spotlight on yourself and your abilities. Like I just never had that. Okay. So do you think things would have been different if you had, yes. you'd still be in the corporate structure or do you think you'd, I don't know if I would still be in the corporate structure, but I think mm -hmm. that, um, like, like one of the things that I wish someone would have taught me about earlier in my career was this concept of values mm -hmm. that everyone share, has values, but we don't all share the same values. And, right. and so I, in my, as a recovering people pleaser, mm. like I would just act on other people's values and not understand why I felt so upset or grumpy or irritated. Uh, and it was because I was stepping on my own values, but I didn't yeah. know it because I didn't know what my own values were. <laughs> so, well, and you were, I mean, do, do we, I mean, did, I mean, I, I guess when I'm in my thirties, I did, you know, it's 20 in my mid twenties. I like what I knew something, but not, you know, you were in your thirties at that time. Right. So, I mean, yeah, like I didn't figure this stuff out until like I was in my mid to late forties. Right. Like, and I that's, a yeah, that's a, bloomer. that's a good point because a lot of people, a lot of us don't find anything uh, of that substance until we're older. And I said, that's what I was saying about maturity. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's good though. What did, was it kind of like, a how can I put it? Was it kind of, those things happen and then it slowly chipped away at the stone to the point where you were working, you were doing it. And then fast forward, uh, if I can jump to it. Yeah. 2006, was it that? You, yeah, you I was fired. Right. So yeah. how did, 
and I'm, I would assume you're blindsided because you're working so hard. I don't think it was anything that you did. It was just part of the. Uh, you know. I, I definitely have culpability, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, in any, there are always two sides to an equation. Sure. And, sure. Uh, and so, yeah, after 10 years of being promoted every 18 to 24 months, I did have the rug pulled out from underneath me and I was fired and I didn't see it coming. In retrospect, I, I can see some pieces that were falling into place, but mm -hmm. it was a challenging time in my life because I was a new mom. My husband and I had adopted uh, our first child nine months earlier. I was head of a an important high stakes department at CBS. Mm -hmm. My marriage was in disarray, despite the fact that we were new parents. Sure. And, and I, you know, I was still on a steep learning curve of how to be a department head. And it's not like they had executive coaches that no, were it sounded you know, like they supporting didn't. us. Yeah. yeah mm -hmm. and, and there was always an expectation that anytime someone, you know, stepped into a new role that you would be able to hit the ground running and be like, yes, knocking it out of the ballpark. But the, the, the reality is like hardly anyone can do that. We all have learning curves. We right. all need support. We all right. need like, you know, constructive criticism, well, et cetera, et cetera. In the, in the industry though is, I mean, you're probably getting pitched how many times a day on, on, on average. I mean, yeah. what, was the, what was your average day? I mean, at, at the, at the time that I was at CBS, it was really like, like close to peak television. It wasn't yeah. quite there yet, but I was yeah. probably hearing at least like eight pitches a day. Um, I mean, we would, I would buy, um, I would hear it probably like between, I want to say like around 350, maybe 400 pitches a season. Wow. And then we would buy 60 or 70 of those pitches of those 60 or 70 projects that were in development once we, and, and the truthfully, like, some of those scripts would just would never come in. And then we would pick up 10 or 12 of those to go to pilot. And then, okay. you know, like two or three of those would go to series and then maybe one would come back for a second season. Wow. And that's, that's the numbers. I mean, really, when you look at the stress level and everything else and your anxiety must've been crazy. I don't, I don't think I could have managed it. I mean, building uh, houses are one thing, designing homes and that type of thing in architecture. But this, I mean, you're, you're affecting millions of people on their couches on a Sunday night or whatever it was. I mean, I can't even imagine what that was like. And then having to deal with the, the onslaught of bosses. Uh, uh, well, you you're, know, you're I, being, you're being so generous, Ted. And, and why is that? I, well, <laughs> I, you know, I think that we all have jobs that have different stress points and okay. I, uh, I want to acknowledge that I could have managed the stress mm -hmm. and the anxiety better, but I, hadn't done the personal work to have the tools because I was so singularly focused on my ambition and my mm -hmm. people pleasing and my perfectionism that if other people were happy, then I was happy. I, I'd never looked at the internal barometer to see if I was in alignment, which is why I think things went off the rails. I and so I, I became impatient. I, you know, snapped at people. Uh, I just was not the best version of myself. And, and I don't want to blame other people for that. That was my responsibility mm -hmm. to course correct. Mm -hmm. And it just took the time that it took for me to get my act together. I mean, being humble is awesome. I mean, that's, uh, we, we all have to be human and I think, mm -hmm. but humble, uh, that, that's just, it's remarkable. Um, Cause I see a lot of people that aren't and they're very, the humanity is just like, man, you have to be human to be inhumane. And it's, it, it, it blows my mind when people like, oh, you know, it's everybody else's fault. I'm very, you know, it's almost narcissistic in a way, mm -hmm. but what do you see with, um, with looking back now, do you see the, um, I mean, it's been almost 20 years, which is yeah. awesome, which is awesome. It's, it's crazy, isn't it? But when you look at it, yeah, you know, I, I, I'm sure you're better for it. I'm sure you're better for it. And I know it's hard because that, that must've been just crushing because we identify so much with our positions and our you know, livelihood and everything else, not just from an economic standpoint, but who we are, right? Indeed. Um, yeah. I, I was so wrapped up in my identity and as a, as a network buyer, you know, in, in a position of power and sure. influence and, and impact. And when that was, um, you know, quote unquote, taken away from me, yeah. I literally didn't know who I was. I wasn't comfortable being a mother. I was really struggling to figure out what it meant to be a, a parent. Uh, I was not, a, you know, it's like 
as a wife, I was like, uh, like this is falling apart. Yeah. And, uh, it, and it wasn't until years later that I recognized and was able to name that I was grieving over the loss of my job. And sure. to reference what you were saying earlier, it's this type of grief called disenfranchised grief. Mm -hmm. And, and so it's any type, and this is a, a term that was coined by a bereavement expert named Kenneth Doka. And it describes any type of loss that's not like openly acknowledged, publicly validated, like mourned socially. Mm -hmm. And so frequently losses in the professional realm, people might be like, oh, you know, I'm so sorry, Ted, that, you know, that piece of art was, you know, writing yeah. wasn't received as well as you wanted it to. That really sucks. What are you working on now? Yeah. <laughs> and, right. And, yeah. And it's just like, okay, let's just like move through it or. There's no ritual of completion or uh, mourning. Yes, exactly. Right? So yeah. like when you, when you've got somebody that's passed away, um, like our, like our mothers, you know, we go through this whole procedural, my mother was cremated, you know, we went through this and it was ongoing, you know, it still affects me. It's 30 years later and I'm still, mm -hmm. you know, but you, you've got that sense like, you know what? Yeah. Okay. That part of that life is complete. Okay. I can, I can, that's a viewing point of where I can move on. In a lot of these cases, you don't have that in work or that when you're trying to identify the false identity, false identity that we have. In a lot of cases um, for you, though, I mean, I, I think it would probably be even harder because you're in the in the some somewhat of the limelight. You're connected all the way around L.A. You probably wanted to move. You probably want to <laughs> just get out of everything. I that's the way I would have been. I would have been just like, leave me in bed, cover me up. You know, that's my anxiety. You know, yeah, um, I would be like, no, I'm ruined. You know, there's no way. You know, yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, you. I, yeah. I'm like, have I you? Mean, were you reading my journals? Because <laughs> no, and, but I get <laughs> no, no, it. I I'm totally, like, <laughs> yeah, I yeah, totally get it. You that's know, exactly I, my experience. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, how, I, I how did, uh, for the people that are going through that type of identity crisis? What's how did you do it? How did how, I mean? I know how you did that, but how did how did you do it? So that tell them how that you got out of that rut and how you continue uh, to climb out of that rut. Yeah. And, and I guess what I want to share is not a template that I would ever want no, anyone no, no, else to no. have to go through. Just as an experience though, just yeah, as a, you know. It's because it, it took me a long, long time to recognize that, that I'd, I'd, I'd experienced a significant loss and, and because I didn't have permission to, to grieve and to mourn, mm -hmm. I was stuck in a place of thinking that I was broken, that there was something wrong with me. And so I had a lot of shame, self-flagellation, self-hatred. And it wasn't until like I, I wound up working with my first coach. And then and then after that, I I began, I, I stumbled upon this thing about grief. And then once I gave myself permission to grieve, but Ted, this was like, I don't even know how many years later. I mean, it was like years and years later. Mm -hmm. And so I was, I was functioning. It, it took me about a year to get out of bed. Uh, and reemerge with the world. Right. Um, but I was so, I just, like, I was just humiliated. Sure. Uh, and, I mean, you're, you're self thinking of embarrassing. You're, yeah. you're, you're just embarrassed. And I, yeah, I can get that. Totally understand that. Yeah. And, and I realize I'm jumping around here a little bit, but no, that's because good. we're not, my experience is that we're not taught how to be with people who have experienced a huge loss. And so typically people will, you know, maybe drop a note, maybe make a phone call or a card, you know, like send over chicken pot pie. Something. And then it's like, great, I've done my bit. And then they back away and they wait until the person who's had a loss reengages and and I just, I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know how to re-engage with the world. And I finally re-engaged just out of necessity because I'm, I'm uh, the primary breadwinner for our family. And it's like, I had to get a job. And, yeah. and so, but I didn't, I, had, I didn't return to wholeness. And it wasn't until years later when I was able to have a grieving process and to mourn that I was able to recognize, like, I'm not broken. There isn't something wrong with me. I just didn't have the tools to acknowledge what losing going that through. meant. Yeah. 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 And the loss of identity, all of it. Right. And I, I know we have around a bit and that's okay. That's, that's part of what we do here. Cause that's, mm -hmm. I mean, that's communication. I think that you're, um, 
if it's too, again, you're a perfectionist like I am. If it's too regimented, you know, it gets, it gets boring. Um, the mentoring side of it. Why, why are you, why are you doing moonshot? What, what's your real, are you trying to help people? Are you trying to heal? Are you, what do you, what's your real, what's the rub? Yeah. I mean, selfishly, yes. It's like the work that I do as a coach is incredibly beneficial to me personally. It's like, I, I learn so much from other people. It, it keeps me, I, I can't, I have to constantly be leaning in. Uh, and uh, because I'm a perfectionist, I always want to make certain that I'm introducing whatever like new tools, readings, podcasts, et cetera, et cetera. But mm -hmm. I do, it's like, I really, I'm driven by like my, my purpose is to help people across their finish line yeah. in whatever form that means. And this grief tool is a primary one to help people across their finish line. And then uh, maybe not so secretly, since I'm going to be talking about it right now, sure. is that sure. I'm, I, I love the work that we do in the entertainment industry. The power of story is so significant. And mm -hmm. I also don't believe that we have fully maximized on the potential of story to help a world that is broken in two and to bring us back Completely agree. Yes, completely yeah. agree. You're, you're, you hit that right on the head. Yep. Uh, and yet the processes in which content is, at least in terms of the screens mm -hmm. that is being brought to the world, I think is deeply flawed and it's time for an upgrade. And, um, you know, as creative people, we know that the best creative comes when we take risks Big and when we take risks, we frequently fail. And within the entertainment industry, people are penalized for failing. There's an expectation that people yeah. are going to bat a thousand, which is an unreasonable expectation. And so, as a whole, the entertainment industry, it's time for us to learn how to process and work with failure. Uh, studies have shown that unprocessed failure leads to a loss of resiliency. Mm -hmm. And in order for us to succeed as individuals and as an industry, we have to be able to tap into resiliency. And so we're cutting ourselves off at the knees by having this expectation of batting a thousand and not processing yeah, failures. It's not sustainable. There's no way. Yeah. And I, I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. And it leads to homogenized content. So, you know, it's because it's like, oh, this is the thing that works. And so yeah. we're just going to keep doing more and more and more of the same. Sure. And so, again, we're doing a wild disservice because we're not sharing and reflecting the stories of the entire world. But it's actually only reflecting a very small percentage of those stories. Right. And it's, yeah, it is very homogenized. What, um, it, it, celebrating celebrating small wins and yeah. this is not a small win by any means when i'm going to bring up but your netflix um mm. show girl boss i mean um do you still hold the uh the record as the, the fastest I, uh from pitch to yeah production I, I i don't know we 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 pitched the show and then less than 24 hours later they came back with a yes which at the time was the fastest Mm -hmm. Yes, in Netflix history, because typically they will, and I and I, I I think this is still the case is that if they like something, then they go, okay, let me run the analytics around sure. it. Let me talk sure. to the other departments. Uh, and so it's it's usually a, a slow yes, <laughs> or a slower it. yes. Yeah. Right. And I know that um, <laughs> it, with with a win like that is awesome. You get this mm -hmm. uh, exciting, you know, uh, I mean, not just adrenaline, but everything is happening. You got. Tell everybody a little bit about that story, if you, if you don't mind, because I want to I want to bring it up. The reason why I'm bringing it up is I want to show them that not everything is perfect either. At the oh, end, yeah. you know, at the end <laughs> of it, you know, I want to show that, you know, um, and how you came back from that as well. So, yeah. So um, my, my business partner, Kay Cannon, um, mm -hmm. she created uh, the Girl Boss series. And it was when I was working with Charlize Theron. I was heading up television for her company and we um, had received this book by Sophia Amoroso um, yeah. called Girl Boss, read it quickly because <laughs> I'm a fast sure. read sure. uh, and, and fell in love with it. 
And, uh, and we invited Kay in to, you know, see if she was interested in what her take on the material might be. Mm -hmm. It's like, this is awesome. And Kay at the time had also had an extraordinary track record where she sold every pitch in the room. Uh, she, uh, can continues to be a highly sought after writer and filmmaker. Mm -hmm. She's a great writer. Yeah. And so we had developed, um, a take on the book and pitched it to the broadcast networks and everybody said no. <laughs> it's just like, yeah. yeah. And it was like coming off of, again, it's, you know, Kay had been batting a thousand and all of a sudden it was like, what? We're not even getting, yeah. you know, to first base here. And, and the truth was that we had always envisioned the show, not for broadcast. We had thought that it was more of a serialized understood show yeah. streaming um, and that, and that, yeah yeah but Kay had a, a a deal at 20th television and their mandate was to sell to the broadcasters and so we needed to honor understood. that understood so when we had that that horrific failure uh, and didn't set it up we quickly redeveloped the show with its original tent and then uh sold it to netflix uh and, uh, and there was, you know, a lot of excitement around it. Mm -hmm. And then unfortunately, uh, the critics didn't love the show. It was, um, and it was also sadly at the time where Sophia's business, um, had filed bankruptcy right at the same time that we were premiering the show. So there were so, like also factors mm -hmm. where people were looking at the concept of the girl boss, and then it's like, oh, now she's in bankruptcy. So this yeah. you know, show that might have had sort of an aspirational feel didn't work. But like we we had set out to tell a story of a of a young woman who had this amazing rise, but we also wanted to like show all of her colors. Right. And that's that hard she, to do. That's oh my gosh. Hard. Yeah. yeah. And that's what critics didn't like. They found yeah. the, the character to be really unlikable. And uh and that was hard because we obviously didn't set out to, you know, yeah. show a character that was unlikable. We wanted to show a character who it's was real. confused, lost, it's... angry, upset, who finds her way. And she's flawed. And that's deeply flawed. We're, yeah. We're all flawed. You know, I would rather, and maybe that's the escape when we see that everything's perfect, but I, I didn't see that in the, in the story at all. Um, and you know, I, I recommend everybody go watch it. If you got Netflix, get on there, take mm -hmm. a look at it. Cause it's awesome. Thank you. Um, and then we, then we were not, we were like one of the first shows not to get a second season from Netflix. <laughs> that right. was, uh, so yeah. does that just come over on an email or is it something that, uh, is it more in depth than that? I mean, is it, are you, are you, uh, you understand that this is going to happen in three months or is it, is it just like, boom, it's like you're. Uh, it was a slower process where yeah. it's like, oh, the, uh, and at the time Netflix wasn't forthcoming in terms of viewership. It's like, they were still keeping that type yeah. of information really yeah. close to the vest. Yeah. But when you're not getting the phone calls, they're like, oh, something's up. So it, it, it took a while to get the official pass, but we, we could feel it coming. How did, how did you grieve that? Um, I think I was, uh, I was mostly upset and disappointed that we didn't have a chance to hear what, why they didn't want to and address the concerns. So is it a, like at the time we were told that people weren't watching it. And then a year or two after that, I was told by a different Netflix executive that it was actually budgetary concerns. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my gosh, because that like we could have address, address that so easily. And in fact, yeah. in thinking about the second season, we knew it wasn't going to cost as much as the first season uh, because the character by that point had, had figured out a home base that so we weren't going to be on location as much so yeah. that we could really contain costs, but we never had that opportunity to, to hear what wasn't working and to say, Oh, this is how we can course correct it. Would that work for you? And that was, that was sad. Sure. I think that, and again, it's a learning curve. It's your first time in a streaming format. Right? Yes. This is it. So yeah. where, um, what was probably the most important thing that you learned out of that? Um, that's a great question. And I, 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 uh, as a, as a group, not just you, but you yeah. Kay as well. And what do you think? I think, that, <laughs> um, 
It's interesting enough because even as a grief recovery specialist, I don't have a good answer for that <laughs> because we, in we spot. I'm sorry. I put, Oh you no, the no, this is good. This is really, really good. Uh, cause we never came together as a group to have a postmortem. Yeah. Um, and then Kay and I, when we started our company, I think we honestly just had a lot of PTSD. Sure. And so I remember early conversations on multiple projects going, she has to be likable. She has to be likable. And so we, we didn't, you know, double down on our intent, we got like overly sensitive to, yeah. Okay. Uh, we, we need to make certain that we like protect our, our female leads. I see. That's, um, yeah. And to, to, to the lack of the creative side of it, I mean, is it, it do you feel like you're like me? I would have said, I'm just still going to go for it. I'm still going to write what I want to write and it's going to do it. And it's going to resonate with the right people. Now, yeah. I, I think that that's still true. I think that, yeah. you know, in that I, you probably have people email you say, hey, when are they going to, is there any way they're going to have a second season? Is there any way that they're going to do that? Right. You probably have that. I would think. Yeah. Cool. It's really fascinating that we're. Yeah. Like and this is, this is 2017, that. right? When it came yeah. out. So yeah. There you go. Wow. Um, <laughs> my, my favorite is when people go, oh, I didn't hate it as much as other people did. <laughs> How do you answer that? Well, thank yeah. you. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, you know, and that's one thing about people that uh, the readers tell you more about your story when they're reading, and you know, when they when they read my writing, they tell me more about it than I did putting into the story. And it's like you don't know if it's you don't think it's critical, you know, or it's a it's a critique, but it's you know, they mean well, yeah. right? Um. So where where is it next? I mean, what's the, what's the next move? What are you doing right now? I know you got a few things. I'm 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 kind of yeah. Uh, so Kay and I um, we uh, we have multiple projects set up on both the TV and the feature mm -hmm. side. A couple years ago, we pivoted the focus of our company, sort of uh, in response to lockdown, sure, uh, and just seeing what was happening in the marketplace um, and the beginnings of the marketplace contractions. So we had started our company where we would be producing the things that Kay had, was writing and directing along with other people's material as well. And then we mm -hmm. made the decision to focus exclusively on Kay's projects sure. and not produce other people's stuff. Like we're of course taking care of the, the things that we had, sure. had on our slate. Understood. And, uh, and so, yeah, we've got, we've got something at Netflix. We've got something at, at, at Disney. We've got mm -hmm. multiple movies set up at various places. I'm not allowed to really talk about sure. any of them specifically, but I, I think the strategic move to focus on K has served us really well in hindsight because sure. of the strike last year and just the marketplace contraction is so significant. I think it's a really good move. I think that uh, you bet on yourself too. And I think that that's a, you're never going to lose on that. I think yeah. the guys are going to do fine. Um, and of course you guys can check online. I'm sure there's some information somewhere <laughs> of what you're doing. Um, I appreciate you big time. I appreciate the message that you're telling people uh, that you're sharing with people. Um, Moonshot, how did that come about? And then we'll, we'll, close out because I want to. Oh hear. yeah. Thank you. And I didn't answer that question that you had previously. Okay. So I appreciate you bringing it back around sure. to that. And so um, that first coach that I had mentioned, she mm -hmm. died tragically in a car accident eight I'm months after we sad. started working together. Mm -hmm. But I was so, because her, the work that we did together was so profound. I mean, she honestly saved my life in so many different ways. And so I decided to study what coaching was. And then I was like, oh my gosh, I love this. And it transformed who I was as a person, and as a professional, because one of the foundations of coaching is that people are creative, resourceful, and whole. Nothing is broken. Nothing needs to be fixed. My job as a coach, as a producer, as a professor is to help the people that I'm working with access their own inner wisdom and, and maybe teach them a few tools along the way to help them align with their values, with their purpose. And it's so exciting and transformational then to see how people through Moonshot Mentor and through my coaching work really be able to blossom and meet their full potential. And so it's like 
a client finished a novel and found a publisher. Mm -hmm. uh, another client um, wrote and produced a short film then that, that we initially had thought was going to help them then put financing together for their feature. The festivals did not embrace the short, didn't get in anywhere. The this big strategic plan didn't come to place. However, people loved the short, circulated it. And then my client wound up um, co-writing and then directing a limited series. It Fantastic. went from short to limited series. And it's like, we never imagined that in a million years. But I think it's because of like permission to grieve, learning about values and purpose sure. and tools. So so that's what I love to do with Moonshot Mentor. And then I've I've got the blog and the podcast as well. Yeah, yeah. your Substack too, don't forget. Right yes. The blog. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Cause I at, at some point I'm gonna take this bigger and wider, but right now I'm I'm trying to impact again the processes in which content is being made mm -hmm. like individually like person by person by person and and then i i do have aspirations and dreams to uh i'm slowly moving into and doing trainings and workshops for companies but i want to take this work bigger sure yeah well, you, you got the great message i i can't I, I really mean it i want to bring it to everybody mm -hmm. that that i can because i think that you're you know you, you find your life's work sometimes later in life and you've Indeed. got you're still doing your your creative aspect with with uh, streaming everything else, writing, storytelling, and that's that's really you know the the beauty of it all. But you're bringing people together and you're doing things mm -hmm. with this mentorship. That's um, I, I really think that uh, it's not just healing for you, but it's going to heal a lot of other people, and um, with very little effort with the message that you're saying, I know there's effort in recording and doing editing and everything else, but the message that you're putting forth there. Um, yeah, it's, it's incredible. I really mean it. I, I know it's changed my views on a lot of things just in the short amount of time that I've known you. Um, you were one of the deciding votes and I didn't even know you then on Substack and it's been a great move for me. Mm -hmm. It's been really good for my subscribers. It's been fantastic. And I, I mm -hmm. really appreciate you. Um, putting the effort out there without knowing about people like me or that are, that are just, you know, not obscurity, but, you know, just not knowing, you know, we're so far away, mm -hmm. California or Michigan, but it's out here. Your message is getting to people and that's why you're here. Mm -hmm. So um, where can everybody find you? Thank you so um, much. Um, LavernMcKinnon.com and on Substack at Moonshot Mentor. Uh, and, uh, I'm on Instagram and, and I just, I, I do want to pause for a moment though, Ted, mm -hmm. and just say how it's been such a pleasure getting to know you. I really appreciate how thoughtful and thorough and, and sincere you are. And, and I also just want to say like, I'm a big believer in listening to actions over words and, um, for people are watching or listening. Like I had a technical snafu, which was causing me high anxiety. And you just really like, you just had so much grace. You were so calm. You were so grounded. You were like, you know, option A, option B. And that just allowed me to breathe. And, and so I just really want to acknowledge that and just say like, I really appreciate how you're showing up in the world uh, and what you're making a stand for. So thank you for, for doing what you're doing. I appreciate that very, very much. And you know what? It's if that's the only thing we got to worry about today, it's a good day. Yeah. It's the least I can do. Um, I'm gonna have all your links in that. We'll we'll take care of that and make sure it's in the description. Thanks. And I recommend you guys definitely uh, check out all the coaching and all the mentoring and all the cool shows and all the things that are happening with this young lady. I think that we're we're probably witnessing greatness. And I want you to definitely check out what Laverne's doing because I think that you guys are you've been you've been affected by her and, and don't even know it because you've watched things that she's been part of. And it's I got to say, it's really cool when you're watching something and your name comes up and I'm like, hey, I know her had her on my podcast <laughs> name dropper. But, you, you know, everybody knows me and I, I want to make sure that they know that I'm, I'm very uh, compassionate when it comes to to making sure people are um, on the right path as long as it's their path. So thank you again. I appreciate it. Stick around for one sec. I'm going to end the uh, conversation, but I, I will be right back with you. Thanks again, Lever. I appreciate it. So guys, um, you know, what else can I say about it? There's, there's definite people in this world that are making differences and you can be that too, I'm sure. 
It might be in your small group of people. It might be worldwide. Who knows? But Laverne's doing it, and she's doing it um, on a smaller scale right now, but I think it's going to be some really amazing things in the future. So check out everything she's doing. Thank you guys for being part of Ted Davies Artistry. Uh, check out everything you're doing on, or what we're doing on Substack. I would love for you guys to be part of that, be part of Ted's tribe. And uh, we will talk to you soon. No envy, no fear. And uh, see you on the next one. <laughs>